our second module on protein macromolecular interactions, we have discussed protein-protein interactions, looked at the specific domains that are involved, the types of interfaces that are involved in these very important complex formations that occur. In this lecture, we will look at protein peptide interactions with specific examples and the concepts that are covered will be the importance of these protein peptide interactions, the specifics, peptides as therapeutics and how they can be used for therapeutics in terms of their cellular uptake. These are the specific keywords that we'll be looking into. When we look at protein peptide interactions, there are of course a subset of protein protein interactions. They play a key role in the biological as well as pathogenic processes in cells. So there are various ways in which these proteins can interact with the short peptide sequences. Their interactions can be sequence dependent or sequence independent. So depending upon the type of protein or the type of interaction that is involved, we will discuss this in terms of the type of interface that is present. We know that protein peptide interactions will play an important role in major cellular processes. As a result, they are associated with various diseases as well, such as cancer, cardi cardiovascular diseases, amyloidosis, and neurodegenerative disorders. The protein peptide interactions in general, they involve intrinsically disordered regions in proteins, which we will be discussing in our lecture on intrinsically disordered proteins. The regions are often the size of small peptide fragments, usually ranging from a 5 to 25 residue long fragment. And they are involved in recognition, regulation, and the signaling that requires dynamic and specific responses. So the specificity and the affinity are both very important in these processes that involve protein-protein, protein-peptide interactions. The protein interaction domain, we studied some specific domains in the previous lecture on protein-protein interactions. These interactions are commonly formed between conserved protein recognition domains and short linear peptide motifs. The globular protein domains can interact with peptides in very diverse ways where they can have a structure that adopts to the specific interaction that is going to occur. For example, there may be the formation, formation of an additional structural component or the specific binding to clefts, or the adoption of a helical conformation that is going to allow this specific interaction to occur in a manner where the protein will adopt to the specific peptide or the protein that it is interacting with. In the protein-protein peptide interactions, we therefore have the protein recognition of these peptides. And as we looked at previously in the terms of the protein-protein recognition interactions, they involve a geometric and a chemical complementarity. So the protein interaction domains, as we see in this specific picture here, can have the peptide fragments that interact with the protein binding domains. Here, we have the binding of a high high affinity phosphotyrosine peptide to the SARC SH2 domain, something that we discussed in a previous lecture. So the distinction or the cavity or the cleft that holds this peptide in the specific protein domain is required for the specific interaction to occur for the function of the protein to progress. So when we look at these two different types of proteins that we looked at previously, the SH3 and the SH2, the SH3 domain is shown here in complex with a polyproline peptide and the SH2 domain in complex with a phosphotyrosyl derived tripeptide. So the interactions as we can see are very specific in the way they interact with the domain that is present on the protein. 
we will look at some specific examples and later on see how specific peptides can be developed and designed to prevent or to inhibit the action of specific enzymes or specific proteins in their protein-protein complex formation. The caspases are one such example that we will be looking at. These are a group of proteases that are implicated in apoptosis, that is programmed cell death, and inflammatory responses. So the loss of this apoptotic control can lead to cancer. Thus, these caspases are an important drug target. The tetrapeptide WEHD has been found to be a caspase inhibitor. This means that any development based on the design of this tetrapeptide, a knowledge of where it binds on caspase is going to be useful for the design of specific peptides that would inhibit the action of these proteins. So many variants of the sequence have been designed and developed for or to act as a caspase inhibitor. So with the knowledge that the tetrapeptide acted as a caspase inhibitor, there were several other peptides that were developed where caspase 2 is shown in complex with the pentapeptide that has an acetyl N terminus followed by an aldehyde at the end where we have this specific pentapeptide sequence that we can see occupies the pocket in a sense that it, it is going to act as a caspase inhibitor. We look at the example of estrogen receptors. Estrogen receptors are receptors that are activated by the estrogen hormone. These are important for central nervous system functions, for regulation of reproduction, for the maintenance of bone density. This means that breast and endometrial cancers are fueled when the hormone estrogen attaches to these receptors. So they can be used as a drug target to develop again inhibitors based on the structure of the domain that is interacting with the peptide. So looking at estrogen receptor peptide inhibitors, there is a leucine-rich pentapeptide motif that is LXXLL, XX indicating that there could be different amino acids present at this location. Of the, so this leucine-rich pentapeptide motif of the estrogen receptor co-activator is targeted. So the peptide inhibitors in this case use a hydrocarbon link to stabilize themselves in the alpha helix form. And this is called a stapled peptide. So we are careful about the geometric complementarity or the shape complementarity that keeps this interaction in a way that it is going to be able to interact with the specific domain on the estrogen receptor, thus preventing the action of the estrogen receptor in a manner that would be desired to prevent any complications from a disease point of view. So when we look at this stapled peptide, we look at the stapled peptide binding to the estrogen receptor in this particular structure. In the BCL2, the B cell lymphoma 2, this is a regulator protein that regulates cell death, that is apoptosis. This has been the target also of drug design strategies. In this case, there is a structural groove that interacts with the binding partners. So taking Q from the type of binding partners that could be involved in interaction with the groove, there are peptide-based drug design approaches to this BCL2 that have been developed. So this is the structure of BCL2 that, that is in complex with a 25 residue peptide from another pro-apoptotic protein. What we see is we see this 25 residue peptide adopting a conformation that is going to make it fit into the structural groove that acts as a binding partner in this case. So if we want to look at the protein-protein interface for drug design, 
we realize that there are not only different subunits of the proteins that form complexes to get to their functional forms, but there are also several other monomeric proteins that would be required to interact with each other to form a functional protein. In this case, what might happen is the specific interface could be used for the development of drugs. So this is the structural information obtained from the protein-protein interface will provide fine foundations for rational drug design. So a knowledge of the interface, a knowledge of the residues that are present in the interface can be used for such an action. And in this case, if the interface is blocked, then the complex does not form, the specific functional protein does not form, and the action cannot take place. So the peptide sequences can be designed that target the interface that are going to inhibit complex formation. So if we have the specific interface and we have a peptide that can bind at the interface, then once the peptide is bound at the interface, this is going to prevent complex formation and will not result in a functional protein, thus inhibiting the specific activity it was performed to do. So this is not possible and we have no functional protein. So when we look at the protein-protein interface for drug design, we have what are called peptidomimetic structures. This identifies a tight binding potential peptide sequence. Then there is modification of the specific peptide sequence to enhance stability, uptake and delivery. The modification of a natural peptide in many cases for higher stability and uptake potential that actually mimics the natural peptide by exploiting the binding mechanism is known as a peptidomimetic because it is mimicking the peptide structure. It is mimicking the activity that the peptide was designed to do. We will look at a specific example to understand this concept. This is the angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, inhibitors designed for this enzyme that work as drugs, as medicine. A short background on this, this is the renin angiotensin system that regulates blood pressure. The system is triggered by low blood pressure. What happens in this case, angiotensin 2 that causes blood vessel contraction is developed or is formed so that there is an increase in blood pressure. So the system is triggered when there is low blood pressure. Angiotensin 2 is produced that results in blood vessel contraction that in turn increases blood pressure. This angiotensin 2 is a hormone that is converted from angiotensin 1 by the angiotensin converting enzyme ACE. This is angiotensin 1. The last two residues are cut off by this specific enzyme ACE producing angiotensin 2 that then leads to blood vessel contraction and increase of blood pressure. So we look at this specific end of this peptide. So we the cleavage occurs at this position here where there is a specific cleavage occurring that forms angiotensin 2. The last two residues, residues number 9 and 10 are cleaved. This ACE thus as we understand in our enzymatic terminology would be a carboxypeptidase where it is cleaving the specific residues from the carboxyl end of the angiotensin 1. So ACE is a low specificity carboxypeptidase and the mechanism which we are not going into involves a tetrahedral transition state. What is shown in the diagram is the substrate positions in relation to the cleaved bond, that is this particular bond, 
where we have the P2, P1, P1 prime and the P2 prime. So the P1 prime and the P2 prime are the ones that are cleaved and the P1 and the P2 are the ones that remain in angiotensin 2. And these are the specific substrate locations where there is the recognition, the binding of this specific peptide that is angiotensin 1. There is also a zinc metal ion involved in the coordination sites that is involved in the overall mechanism of the ACE enzyme. What we have, therefore, is the design of an AC in inhibitor. What can happen is there can be targeting of specific sites. The targeting of the zinc 2 plus resulted from a starting point where a phenylalanine allaproline tripeptide was found to be an inhibitor of ACE. So this inhibitor was looked at from a structural point of view and what happened was specific zinc coordinated groups were attached to the moiety to have a recognition of the sites to see how they could be developed in a drug approach where we had a drug or there is a drug called captopril that works in this way targeting the zinc. So when if we look at captopril bound ACE in this structure, the sulfhydryl group coordinates the zinc ion. There is a methyl group that occupies the S1 prime site and a prolyl group that occupies the S2 prime site. So this is where it acts, the specific active site of this ACE bound to captopril. However, there were modifications of captopril required for avoiding some side effects, for example, like rashes. So this indicated that there would have to be a development at a region other than the zinc binding site where the S1 site could also be targeted. So the solution was to develop a non-SH inhibitor that bound to S1 with high affinity. So in this case, this resulted in the development of enalaprilat, which had the capability of binding to zinc, but did not have the thiol group present. Further modifications led to the development of lisinopril, which had a lysine residue present here in the active site of the protein, where this methyl group for alanine was replaced with a lysine group. In this case, when the targeting offers specific interactions, that is where the design comes into the picture. So when we look at the specific design and how it can interact with the substrate residues that are, or the substrate residues, in this case, the substrate being a peptide, and the specific residues present in the protein, that is important in the design of such inhibitors of the protein. So looking at the AC in inhibitor, what happened, the presence of the lysine resulted in greater polar contacts. There was the coordination with the zinc ion here, specific coordination sites that could be occurred with the prolyl residue and with the lysine residue, the formation of extra polar contacts. So all this goes into the design of an inhibitor. We learned in our enzyme inhibition studies how these can be determined and how the specific inhibition constants of these compounds determined from enzyme kinetic studies. So when we look at the protein interaction domain, we revisit the SARC homology SH2. We found out that this is a phosphotyrosine recognition domain that plays a crucial role in important signal transduction events. This interaction keeps the SARC kinase form down regulated 
and the domain also serves as a binding site for a signaling. STAT3, that is a signal transducer and activator of transcription 3. But without, without going into the details of this, the specific sequence, the peptide sequence, is recognized by a domain. So, this peptide sequence can now be modified considering this as a lead in a peptidomimetic compound development for an effective drug. So these modifications that can occur result can result in the alteration of amino acids to non-natural amino acids for better binding, for better affinity. There could be cyclization of the peptides. There are examples of cyclic peptide antibiotics. They could also be constraining the peptide like we saw in a stapled peptide so that it forms a specific secondary structural unit, for example, the alpha helix that would fit into the binding pocket or the binding cleft to result in better inhibition. So looking at peptides as therapeutics, currently the pharmaceutical market is occupied with small molecule drugs, but the challenge of this is target specificity and cell membrane permeability. There are synthetic drugs available for a specific target, but what happens in most cases, there is low biomembrane permeability, which hampers systemic drug distribution and in turn limits its therapeutic value. Peptides, on the contrary, have higher selectivity because of their multiple points of contact with the target that is possible. There are also specific sequences of peptides that are capable of penetrating cell membranes and have antimicrobial properties. Thus, these peptides can be utilized in therapeutics to increase the uptake efficiency of drugs as antimicrobials and so on. There are cell penetrating peptides that are able to penetrate biological membranes. These are short peptides and they facilitate the transport of bioactive molecules into the cells. So these are also very interesting peptides that have a specific unit. So if this is a cell penetrating peptide and there is a specific bioactive molecule that has been has to be transported inside the cell, this bioactive molecule is attached to the CPP and then because this peptide can penetrate the cell, it allows the transport and the delivery of the bioactive molecule within the cell. There are several methods by which this can occur. There is direct penetration or endocytosis pathways. We will just look at them from a uh, point of view, understanding how they work. So in an inverted micelle formation, what happens is there is the encapsulation of this peptide, so to speak, that then transfers it from the outer part of the membrane inside the cell. In a carpet model, there are coverages of the lipid bilayer that have a movement that allow the transport. In the pore formation, these are triggered, again, by the movement of the fluid membrane that we know, the leaflet of the membrane, allowing the transport of biomolecules. So we understand the, that the interactions of these peptides with the membranes is crucial in this to occur, or in this specific formation to occur. In the endocytosis pathways, there are methods by which there are formations of such entrapped or encapsulated peptides that are then transferred within the cell. If we look at protein receptor interaction for viral entry, we will be, look, we will be having a lecture on viral proteins later. But the understanding that the virus has to enter the host cell via, again, a receptor-mediating binding followed by membrane fusion. So in this case, there is a host and there is the virus. And there is a specific glycoprotein that is present on the virus surface. 
and there is a receptor that has a specific recognition site. Then there is the interaction that allows then the virus to get into contact with the host. So there are peptides that have been designed that can inhibit this viral entry, where the studying the sequence that are, is involved in the receptor binding and the mechanism of binding, the peptide sequence can be developed to inhibit the receptor binding. In turn, the virus will not be able to attack the host. So the peptide sequence can mimic the sequence involved in receptor binding and that can be employed to prevent this process. For example, this particular 36 amino acid peptide has been developed as an HIV fusion inhibitor. So when we look at protein-peptide interactions that are a subset of protein-protein interactions, they are crucial, we re realize, for many cellular processes. And disruption of these interactions causes inhibitions of their specific actions. A good way to inhibit or regulate their action is to target specific protein-protein interactions. And we saw how protein-peptide interactions find applicability as specific therapeutics. There are specific detection methods. For example, how do we know that the protein, in this, which is the ligand in this case, can bind that changes the protein conformation? There are several detection methods that can be used, X-ray crystallography, AFM, PRET, or NMR spectroscopy, depending upon the type of interaction that is being studied. And these detection methods are going to lead us to better peptide mimetics, to better understanding of our protein-protein interfaces and protein-peptide interfaces. So the peptide sequences that can specifically bind in the interface of the protein-protein complex, a knowledge of that will help us to design inhibitors of enzymes that are going to inhibit the complex formation. And because of their high specificity and selectivity, these peptide-based drugs are being developed. These are the references. Thank you.